Hi, everyone. Thanks for staying. <laughs> it's nice. So um, let's see. This is a ballroom, so the first dance is going to be salsa. Who joins me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, there is a very important analogy I want to make, actually, in my presentation uh, between the dance. I don't know who, who of you likes to dance. Sure, we are hackers. No, I do, actually. <laughs> there you go. Um, there's some very important thing about dancing, is that you execute some steps, you reach a goal, you enjoy it, and you have to learn it somehow. So to me, it's like security, right? You have to learn it, you have to learn from someone, you have to execute, and you have, you have to get to the point where you enjoy it. That's it, so that's about generali generalities. Um, we are Avatar, and um, we are hackers. So I'm, I'm myself is the last ha least hacker of the of the group of, of my group. We are coming from Crisis Lab. Maybe you heard our name. Uh, we are also doing CTF. If you ever do CTF, you know you know the name Spam and Hacks. Um, we do the Spam and Hacks team as well. And uh, there's a famous investor uh, called Mark Andresen. You you know the name Mark Andresen? No, you know the name Netscape. Maybe, yeah, Mosaic. Now he was the one who invented Mosaic and who, yeah, the Mosaic browser. He was the godfather of browsers, okay? After that, he turns an investor and he says, like, let's, let's put some money into this IT thing that seems to be interesting. And, and, and he puts this famous quote in 2011 that software is eating the world. And if you see the economy changing, actually, uh, all the economies, all the, uh, uh, all these, uh, uh, all, all the topics, all the subjects are, are, are digitalized now, and this is a very big generality. But here comes the problem: that education and people have a hard time to keep up with this. Right? There is, there is always this famous quote: "There is not enough skilled programmers," and so on. You might agree or you might not agree, but it's true that the more the, the, the world is coming, becoming digitized and software-based, the more, not only the users, but those who produce this whole stuff have a hard time to catch up. And I'm going to uh, shoot a couple of buzzwords here. So I say, we need more skilled people, but not only skilled people, we do believe, and this is our fundamental mission, that each and any of these people have to have at least a basic understanding of security, okay? And I'm gonna show you that this is not the case today. And this is why we are where we are right now. Love bad software, okay? So why is this important? And, and, and this is something might be trivial to you. Uh, there's a lot of buzzwords, new, new technologies coming up. For example, IoT, everyone talks about IoT. Uh, security is a nightmare for IoT, right? You, you, do, uh, you do agree that, that, that IoT is becoming widespread and the, one of the biggest concerns people uh, not using IoT because they say, hey, I'm gonna get hacked. And actually, they do, right? If you if you remember, uh, recently that was in the news. Some some lame people installed like baby uh, baby monitoring machines, and some hacker got into it and abused the baby. And I was like, come on, we cannot allow technology to be like that. I don't want my kid to be exposed like. And my kid is definitely not a hacker yet, so he's two. So IoT is a big thing, and it, it, I, I mean, monitoring is one thing, it's serious enough, but if you talk about pacemakers, who heard about Barnaby Jack? You all did, I hope. I, I wanna see at least some hands. <laughs> okay, so Barnaby Jack uh, uh, is a very brilliant, at the same time, very sad story. Uh, he, uh, uh, I think it was 2013, the 12, when he demonstrated that you can deliver a deadly electrical shock to a person's pacemaker because it's remotely controlled. So what he did was, was, was very interesting. It was a typical IoT problem. So it turns out that there is a bedside unit for these patients you can hack into. So it's a big, with a simple ping, you can get the, the, the serial number and the, 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 the version of that, that device. Uh, unfortunately, everything is default setting. We know this pretty well from Mirai these days. Everything is default setting. He hacked into it, he updated the firmware, and he was able to do whatever with the patient. This is scary. Not only this, it turns out that these devices communicated with the server to download the, soft, the, the firmware, 
And not only download, they upload it. So he managed, he, he demonstrated it's possible to take the firmware, which he modified, and upload it to the central server, and possibly to push it to all these devices and around the world. Now, this is a very scary uh, prospect, and I don't want to be a pacemaker patient after this, you, you can imagine. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, this is something uh, you and I and we all have to do about, so do it better. Another thing is self-driving cars. Another big hype like, hey, that's cool. And I jump into the car and it brings me to my destination, so uh, I don't even need a cab or, or even Uber, right? It's my car is going to be my Uber. Uh, unfortunately, cars can be hacked, and this was demonstrated by Charlie Miller and others, and this was demonstrated partially by us, so, so we had a presentation at Hacktivity in Budapest last year, and, yeah, last year, uh, where we said like, hey guys, it's, it's difficult to actually hack into the car, so some people demonstrated it, and, but it's, it's kind of a, a, an elite hacker's thing, so why not hack into the, into the computer of the mechanic? That's easy. They are using Windows 7s, Windows XP's, and it's, they are so last century. And it turns out this is not, this is not very difficult. This, this is not very uh, different from, from the hack that happened in Stuxnet. So the mentality is the same. Basically, in this case, uh, you infect a computer that controls a unit. Uh, in, the, in the Stuxnet case, it was the PLC. In our case, it was the ECU on the car. The ECU is the, the device that controls all the mechanical things and collects sensor information and so on. So what we demonstrated, and it turned out to be actually very bad, so uh, what we demonstrated is that you hack into the PC of the, of the mechanic, which is not well protected. The mechanics are not experts. They don't care about their computers. And, um, and uh, with a simple trick, uh, you, can, you can modify after that the protocol. And we, may, we were able to switch off the, the airbag the street steering, the brakes, um, you name it. The problem is that these, these devices are, are, are somewhat uh, standardized uh, over the industry. So um, we demonstrated it on, on one type of a car. I don't want to mention the name. But uh, after that, the media picked it up. And just for you to see, when you are security researchers, and the first talk was on responsible disclosure, we made a public appearance in Hacktivity. We mentioned the name of the manufacturer, but not as this is car can be hacked. We just said, we demonstrated it on one car. It could be any cars, because the cars use the same principle. Now, uh, some journalists picked it up from the UK, put an article, and there was a huge, like, this manufacturer is bad, it was hacked. So you can imagine, the next day we got a call, uh, so guys, what is this? And since that, we have a somewhat of a, of a cold relationship with, with this manufacturer. Uh, the good thing is that other manufacturers called. So it's like, hey, nice, I heard that. Uh, so another uh, of this, of this uh, typical and interesting stuff, and, and we, we care about you know, high impact things, is critical infrastructure. People talk about that a lot. And we did uh, a couple of things. Uh, I'm talking about here Crisis Lab, not Avatar, so the two are related. What we did here is, uh, first we discovered Duku. If you, you heard about Duku, maybe. Okay, so we discovered Duku. It was a, um, a malware deployed at, at a certain company. It was a, a CA, I can say. And it was used to, to monitor the information flowing through that CA. And um, uh, it turned out that it's very similar to Stuxnet, and similar to the point that they had code parts that were exactly the same. So we put out a report and we demonstrated that it is the same. And, and people started to recognize us. Um, and, and for us, we are here in Eastern Europe, so for us it was a really revealing experience when you publish a report, and first of all, it, it's not a, a vulnerability disclosure like two pages. We are, we are researchers at the university, so we, we tend to be a bit scientific. So it was, I think it was a 60 pages report with all the, all the, the details and everything, uh, uh, joined with, uh, with, a, with a vendor. And uh, people started calling us, and the first question was like, so where is, where is Hungary? So, uh, wh what are you doing there? And the second of all is like, who are you? And it's like, mm, okay. Uh, and the good thing is that since that people pick it up, and there's in, in security, it's very important to build a trust relationship because since that, if we talk to these researchers, like name the big companies in security, and there is a an email address when they write that, they actually respond. They say um, that there was a, a recent uh, incident when we reported something, and within two two hours, they said like. We checked the whole code base, and it's not there. 
And this was the, the change from A to B. So after, after Dooku, we, we did some work uh, on Flame and, and people kept writing like books and stuff, weird things. Um, what is uh, the next, next thing I wanted to point to you is that it's a, this is what, what salespeople like to say is like most of the vulnerabilities are attacks are via websites and so on. And this is true. The problem is here that um, uh, in the media, usually the, the, big, the big shots gets publicized, like shell shock and heart bleed, and this is serious stuff you should be protecting against. What they don't say is actually that, that, that most of the problem doesn't come from these high profile attacks. Most of the problem comes from the very, very basic attacks. And here I'm slowly getting to the point, actually. <laughs> is is um, we as hackers, uh, or can I say we as hackers? So we as hackers care a lot about this, this very specific and very targeted and very you know, uh, nasty and very, very sophisticated attacks. Uh, but for, for, for the world, this is not causing the problem. For the world, it's still a vast top 10. And this is a key message. Like, like, uh, how do we, how do we fix this in the world, while still caring about shell shock and all the others, but but the the fundamentals are not fixed yet. And it's not about websites. It's about the apps too. So most of the apps are actually faulty. And this leads to to to, to uh, bigger attacks. If you heard about the target attack, uh, you heard about the target attack. Target, you know what target is. Some people say yes. Okay. Uh, here are the typical attacks. How 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 these organizations get get uh, get attacked. Now the important thing is here that some of the organizations are actually prudent. Now in the case of Target, it wasn't the case. They had very good vendor products. They bought all that expensive stuff. They outsourced the monitoring to India. Um, and I'm not saying, I'm just saying that actually the monitoring was pretty good. Uh, the product detected the, the, the malware that was deployed. The Indian team reported back to Target and they didn't care. And it wasn't that they received alarms of hundreds of alarms per, per, uh, per day. It was just that they, they were negligible. What I'm trying to say here is it's no matter what technology you have, it's the human at the end of the day who decides who has to do it properly. Uh, same for uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Their security was pretty good, but they had a vendor, a third-party vendor with a web web application that was not very good. <clears throat> and I know that a lot of companies these days are doing, uh, you know, some kind of auditing and testing on the vendors, but uh, it's it's very difficult to do it uh, to right to the bottom. And another case is here: community health. That uh, uh, as soon as Heartbleed came out, they got hacked. Uh, and this is a particular case because healthcare data is not like any data. You might say like your credit card data is serious. Well, think about your healthcare data. You're, you can change your credit card. You cannot change your healthcare history. It's all about you. So um, let me just uh, uh, go to this uh, more. Um, so what is the process to fix it? Uh, first, well, you, you should write secure code. I, I do believe that, that fixing retrospectively it's a lot of effort, and it, it doesn't pay off. I'll show you why. So here's the typical soft, secure software development life cycle. You plan properly, you execute properly, you test properly, and it's a long cycle. What's the problem here? I, I, I showed it in blue, that hackers, the experts, come in almost at the end. right? And, and for companies, this is really costly. I, I do argue, and this is just to show you some, some numbers. This numbers might be a little bit more down by, by the time. But uh, if you can catch problems at the beginning, so really teach people who produce the code, it's much, much better than employing a lot of hackers. I'm sorry, employing a lot of hackers. I don't want to take your jobs. What I'm saying is that you guys, hackers, you are expensive, right? And, and to be honest, like, those of you who are pen testers, you know exactly if you have a job, if you have an auditing job, and you found the N plus first SQL injection vulnerability, you are like, ah, oh, come on, guys, don't do the basic mistakes. And this is a, this is a serious problem, because here we, here we are wasting brain power, here we are wasting, wasting serious money. So we should focus at the beginning. And uh, uh, 
uh, what what we can do is of course code code reuse uh, code reuse has to be taken very very cautiously because uh, as we saw with the uh, 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 with the reusing of for example open SSL that if you use even very basic code can be the the entry point onto your to your uh, security architecture you should always do a careful debugging uh, and um, one particular example I always tell my students is is rubber duck debugging who knows rubber duck debugging from you uh, very good so if you if you are, ever want to teach this stuff then I, what I, I do for my classes actually is that I, I, I buy them these ducks and I give them on the first class. It's like use them. And you would be surprised how much it improves code. A lot. Now, uh, you should always do code review, but do it first yourself and then do it to, to the other people. There's a very good uh, measure of code review quality. It's like the WTFs per minute. And uh, of course, pair programming, and except for Chuck Norris, we usually do it in pairs. Um, Another thing is that, that uh, uh, there's a lot of tools, use them. It is surprising how many developers cannot use uh, basic security code testing uh, uh, tools. And one last thing is since we, some of our, our team is from crypto, never ever design your own crypto unless you know what you're doing, okay? A lot of people tried, a lot of people failed. We've seen applications where they said, oh, wow, we designed this cool whatever authentication method. No, don't do it. So um, people speak a lot about the, the major problem. This is this, we are lacking people. So what's the solution? Let's start security, uh, coding boot camps. Let's start uh, curricula that, that, that develop more, more coders. Uh, well, it's good. We should have more IT people and developers and programmers and even hackers. But it's very important to that these guys actually understand what they're doing, okay? And we used to, you should say that universities solve the problem. Well, they don't. There was a recent survey that showed that, for example, in the US, top, you can graduate from top universities, almost all of the top universities, without ever having a security course, ever. And these guys go out and be software developers, architects, or whatever. I'm not saying they don't pick up the knowledge after that, but it's, it's just not common. And this is not a surprise. Um, um, sorry to have this a little bit of, a, of this education side of the, of the problem, but this is how we teach security. Do you, do you think that these people will learn security? No, because they are listening to something that's, that's written on the whiteboard. And sometimes you can learn it after that on the job, but since security training is actually very costly, uh, it only gets to a very few people, usually the top people like you, hackers, you get the, you get the, the knowledge, you self-develop yourself. But for the rest of the people, those who produce the applications, those who, who write the websites, they don't get this training. They still are stuck with their university skills, unless they are really, really pushy and they learn it themselves. The other thing, it's not fun. I mean, if you go to the hacking village, there's a lot of games and, and, and there's DCTF, so it's a hacking and security teaching should be fun, right? And most of the trainings are not like that. Some of them are. Uh, but how do you scale it up? So we got to the got to the point of Avatar um, just at the very end. So let me know. Uh, let me let me show you this a little bit. Um, we created this platform to to actually let anyone to start playing and learn. Okay, and it's no it's no rocket science. It's just a collection of hands-on practical exercises. Now the the good thing about this is that it works. It's uh, it's it's quick. So you open your browser and you start hacking. That's so easy. Um, we realize that a lot of people uh, don't know how to use security tools. And it's not a problem because sometimes I mean, they can learn, but it takes some time to, to, to set up things. So in our, in our case, we put up like tool tutorials, Unicorn Engine, Wireshark, and Map, just name it. We started with a couple of, couple of these tools. And we take this, these people step by step in a challenge style. So you solve the things, you submit a solution, you get further, you challenge yourself and you go and, and at the end you, you, we plan to arrive at a, like a use case scenario. We also create hacking exercises, we do participate in hacking exercises, this is DEF CON last year. Uh, we are the finalist team. But uh, most of all, and this is our, our, our really the mission we want to we wanna pursue, we want to teach security to everyone. We don't believe that security belongs to the elite hackers. 
Security belongs to everyone. Security belongs to the last software developer who just graduated that has no idea what an XSS means. Okay. So I, I would like to ask you to actually join this community. We created a, a custom CTF for Def Camp. You can come to our both in the hacking village. Try the CTF. You check, just try it for yourself if it's for you or if it's not. And um, um, we have um, in the platform a, a variety of exercises. So anything from web security to IoT security, embedded security, all that stuff, all running from the browser. So it's um, up to you. Try it. Thank you very much. If you have questions, shoot them. Do you have the mic? There's a question. Or if you can shout, that's OK, too. Yes, so there are development tools to actually avoid this problem. The problem is that, that those who develop, sometimes they don't know the tools, they don't use the tools. So we do believe that there has to be like a, it's almost like a driver's license for development. So you, you have to know the basics and to avoid this kind of errors, exactly what you say. And if, even if you have websites, what you mentioned, that are vulnerable, I mean, just fix them. And that's that's actually that's a community thing, uh, and here we come back to the, the to, to the issue of bug bounties. Bug bounties are actually, are actually a great thing, but it's that's for rich companies, right? So, I I do believe that actually bug bounties should be pushed down to the level of a of a random website, so people should be able to report this to the websites developers and say you should fix this kind of things. Did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Other questions? If not, you can find us in the in the hacking village, just talk as much as you want. Thank you very much. <laughs>